Hello, everybody. Let's begin with a moment of silence and reflection, please. All right. Thank you very much. And uh, we'll officially call the meeting to order and remind everyone that the table in my left corner that way has copies of the agenda and some more information to follow along if you so choose. And we're now on number three, Pledge of Allegiance. To my right, the flag, please. <coughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Number four, consideration of the agenda, and uh, is there a motion that we approve the agenda? Motion to approve. I'll second it. All right, any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Say no. The agenda is approved as submitted. Thank you, Madam Clerk. And number five, consideration of approving the minutes of October 18. Is there a motion? I would have had a question is, is, do we not have the special meeting for November the 8th? Uh, yes, that? those are That'll be on this, the next yeah, one. I'll make a motion we approve the, the minutes from our last meeting. Looking for a second. So I say. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Unanimously approved. Public comments. <clears throat> we have one person signed up. Mr. Bauer, if you would come forward and Speak into the microphone, give us your address and your name. You know the procedure extremely well, I'm sure. Yes, I do. Good evening, Jim Bauer, 329 Ocean Boulevard West. Um, on item 11, uh, regarding the, the resurfacing and bike path, um, after Ian, I called to, to the New York City, uh, the North Carolina DOT to uh, ask what's going on with the groundwater, what's going on with the, the, the huge puddle that we had that stretched for over a quarter mile after Ian. The gentleman called me back. He said he has absolutely no idea what's going on as far as the, New York, the, the DOT side and is waiting to hear from the town. He also says that it, this might be stopped by environmental issues, which I've never heard anything about before this. Um, we still have to address the permeability, uh, the, the idea of uh, paving another half square mile of road and where that flood water is going to go, especially after a, a considerable storm like Ian. And uh, we also have to ask who wants this. Most of the people that I speak to don't want a bike path, or if there was a bike path, wouldn't allow their children to bike on it. They would much rather go down Brunswick or some less traveled road. So once again, you have to, I think we should ask before we outlay money, and we should also have a plan. Item 17 and 24 about uh, the Hurricane Ian and the coastal storm damage. Um, this is the first beach that I've ever been to that during storms don't bulldoze the access out to the beach closed to allow for no permeability through the burn. Because of that, by the fire, by the fire station, there was a huge washout of sand. And obviously the, obviously the water came up and would have been stopped by the berm, but it wasn't because the hole was, still, hole was still there and, of course, contributed to the widespread flooding that we had uh, during Ian. I would suggest that maybe somebody from the town might want to bulldoze those clothes that might, be, that might become part of what we should do as part of our emergency operations plan. Um, uh, the, uh, and it can't be argued because of the tremendous amount of sand wash out on Ocean Boulevard West. And then the last thing, which is items 18, 19, 20, about the fiscal outlay, I would love to know what's going on with the pier. We haven't heard a word. There's nothing on, there's nothing on the agenda for this. What's it going to cost to insure? Still asking that. Been asking that since, since this uh, rigmarole started. Thank you very much. All right, that completes our list of speakers for the public comments. We're on number seven. Mr. Franway and Assistant Town Manager Ferguson.
Good evening, everyone. Fran Way is here this evening to give us our annual monitoring report. We always do surveys in the spring. Um, ATM spends the next few months analyzing the data, and then Fran comes in the September, October, November time frame whenever they compile results to give the public a snapshot of how our beach performed over the last year. So I'll introduce Fran Way with ATM. Hello, commissioners. Uh, um, uh, thank you, Christy. Uh, yeah, we'll just get right into it. We're a coastal engineering firm. Uh, we've been working for the town for about 15 years. Uh, and, you know, we've done lots of different, you know, projects with the town, truck hauls, inlet, using inlet bar areas, kind of smaller nourishments. And, of course, you know, the biggest one that, we've, that the town's ever done this last spring. Let me see if I... Okay, there we go. Uh, so here we have the, the annual monitoring analysis, kind of basically what, what we're doing, why we're doing it. I'm not sure why that. Are those? Uh, And I, I can look at the <laughs> So basically, we're looking at volume change. We can see the volume. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Turn the other one over there toward me. If you turn that one, that one. Yeah. There you go. There you go. Thank you, Tim. So we're, we're looking at volume change. We're looking at shoreline change. We're doing it every year. Uh, the town's been doing it you know, for over 20 years now. And a lot of times it is to keep the look at the nourishment, look where the beach is doing well, look where the beach needs some some you know maybe some attention, and then for uh, planning and for FEMA eligibility, uh, you know the the town has a, a FEMA a quote unquote engineered beach, where FEMA will come in and and help uh, offset a you know, significant cost because they kind of re just like the Army Corps of Engineers when they do their beach nourishments. They realize that the, the beach acts, you know, as, a, as a, the, a, a storm, a critical storm buffer. And, you know, if we can kind of keep the, the storm effects on the beach and on the dunes, we can save a lot of infrastructure behind it. Uh, uh, the hurricane season, 2021, this is, I have this screenshot, 2021. 2021 was a really, I'm considering minor. Uh, there, there were some tropical storms, there were some other things, but really it, it, was a, it was a good year. It was kind of one of the years where, where the town kind of got just, you know, there, there's above average years and they're below average years. And 2021 was a good one where it was below average and the, the town had been hit by quite a few, you know, uh, Michael, Lawrence, Dorian, Isaias, and then of course now this year we had Ian with it, you know, it hit at a king tide and had five feet of storm surge. And so it wasn't very, very strong storm category-wise, but, you know, when the storm hits right at the peak king tide with five feet of surge, uh, you know, that, that, that's quite, you know, damaging. Uh, and then we just had, you know, the colds so so ago. The effects of Ian and Nicole are not in this annual monitoring report. So basically we're, we're looking at, at the previous year, and but uh, you know, obviously they do, uh, they do should be next. Uh, and here's kind of the, the nourishment that I've mentioned before, about one point over about 1.54 uh, million cubic yards. It's a, the biggest nourishment ever on Holden Beach. Uh, it went from January 7 to April 12. There were two bar areas. One was kind of off of Western Oak Island, and one was off of Home uh, Beach, kind of in the pier area. The bar areas were two to three miles offshore. Uh, and then you needed the, the two ships for Leaf Marine that they did it, those were the two dredges that worked the, the project. Uh, and you know, it was a very successful project. Really nice sand, nice color, nice coarseness. Uh, we were very happy with it. Uh, it, it you know, and it, there were a few delays for weeks. But uh, the, the the dredger, but you know it, it, it was it was a good successful project. 
and it was you know all FEMA reimbursable at this point because the town had uh, all the FEMA project basically when the town did their 2017 major nourishment they could use uh, Hurricane Matthew funding to offset some of those costs and for this project uh, Hurricane Florence, Hurricane Michael, Hurricane Dorian, Hurricane Isaias all had you know offset costs for this so uh, you know FEMA was you know very helpful in, in getting this project uh, here's just some other photos of kind of the nursing in the flag last spring. And then Montefiore Inlet crossing on the very east end. That also got a nourishment last year. Uh, it was much smaller, uh, you know, just you know, about 100,000 cubic yards. And so, you know, much smaller, but it's still, you know, add together. It's, 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 a, it's a wonderful you know, it's a wonderful spring where, you know, over 1.6 million cubic yards of material, new materials can grow in the uh, So every year, all up and down the beach, every thousand feet, we do uh, our volume analysis, and we do kind of shoreline change analysis. And we do it a couple different ways, but basically we are, we're looking at, you know, basically the upper beach. Uh, but then we're also looking at that 30 feet depth and that's, you know, that's 2,000 feet offshore, so it's well in the deeper water. But we'll look at kind of just, uh, you know, how the upper beach did, how the surf zone did, and how that, that deeper water did, because it that all kind of, you know, uh, has an effect. You know, sometimes the material kind of in the surf zone where you can't see it, especially if it's like a, I mean, a sandbar like this, that really helps in kind of breaking waves and, and so even though you can't see it, it is still there and still doing something. Uh, and then there's kind of a cumulative effect uh, that, that the town is kind of uh, benefiting from, from the major, the 2017 nourishment and now the 2022, where you can see that the lower line here is that, you know, pre-Hurricane Act, and the beach, basically there's still sand left. 2017 sand is still there and still benefiting the beach, and now you know the beach is even you know more healthy. Uh, this is our volume change uh, from last year to this year, and obviously the, the nourishment is uh, you can see everything above this line is positive, everything below it is, is negative, is eroding. Uh, so the left hand did have some erosion last year. Uh, basically, overall, uh, the, the entire Island wide was about 1.6 million cubic yards of gain over the last year. So that's, that's really good. But obviously, and I was talking with uh, Commissioner Pat about um, the West End. The West End, the, the dune system is 400, 500 feet wide. The West End is a nice, healthy dune system. Uh, but, you know, it does seem to be in the last few years there, there has been some more erosion. And so, you know, we're going to you know, look into that and then just kind of an eye out on that. But I mean, obviously, the net sand transport is east to west. So all the sand here we're putting, it will go west uh, in the long term. And that's kind of, we knew that was going to happen. So this sand will benefit those that western shore. Of the shore. <coughs> this is just mean high water shoreline change. And it's the same, it's very similar to the volume change. You know, for the, the 
the nursery project, you know, over you know, 200 feet of new shoreline was created. Uh, you know, uh, anywhere between 150 and 200 feet of shoreline. Uh, and then the shoreline changed wasn't as bad over here on the west end, uh, but there was obviously some erosion in, in this area, and we'll have to you know, keep an eye on it. We'll, we'll, we'll be able to look at that. Uh, and then, you know, you, you know uh, there, there are a few different options you can look at. Uh, previously, that system was just, the dune system was so wide, and the beach, you know, was, was just so healthy. And we knew the, the sand, the sand that we're placing on the east will go west. Uh, but, you know, now we might have to do something maybe a little more active. And we were kind of like that with more passive management. Uh, and so we'll, we're going to look into that. Uh, back to 2000 to uh, 2022, the beach is much health, healthier now than it was. Uh, and the 2000 shoreline, that, that was, uh, if you can go back and look at the in Google Earth or whatever, the, the 2000, 1999 aerials, the beach on Holden Beach was not in great shape. There were structures out on the beach. Uh, even on the west end, of the, the dune system was not that wide as it is now. Uh, but so comparing that, but this is right around 2000 is when the Army Corps of Engineers in town really kind of stepped up the game in terms of beach management and putting sand on the beach and that sort of thing. And uh, basically, you know, if, if there were no nourishments at all in the last 20 years, you know, the, the difference, the delta between where the beach is now and where it would be is, you know, over 300 feet, some of these areas. Or so, yeah, so, you know, you, you're basically, you know, you're 300 foot wider now than you would be if you didn't do anything for the last So, you know, the beach does look really good, and then even at the beginning, I, uh, I did, it's moving really good. Big beach images from the, uh, the east end, from 1986 to 1998, uh, were the worst structures out on the beach. Uh, this is, you know, just, you know, 25 years ago. Uh, so the, the beach was, it was in much uh, kind of worse shape back then. And these were from Dr. Cleary, uh, from the Houston Manager Finance for the state. So that's the next thing. That is uh, that's kind of just a, a quick overview. Uh, you know, the Corps is working on their, their separate 50-year study, and they're trying to find, you know, 50 years worth of sand, and that's pretty difficult. We're, we're good at finding, you know, a million, two million cubic yards of sand. They're trying to find, you know, 25 or 30 million. That's, that's difficult. It's offshore. Isn't, there's, there's not a whole lot of... There's, there's, some, there's definitely some material, and we've been very successful with it, but trying to find that much material is really difficult. FEMA coordination, we, you know, we're continuing to coordinate with FEMA, and obviously this is still engineered beach, so uh, FEMA did not, for Ian, uh, FEMA did not come in, and, and they, didn't, they didn't feel it was, uh, a, you know, a, an emergency where they had to come in and mitigate for this section of beach. But, you know, any kind of major storm, we're, we'll, we're going to be working with FEMA again. Uh, the Lockwood Folly Inlet crossing and the bend wider on the Lockwood Folly Inlet, uh, you know, that's always kind of just something you watch. And then the West End analysis, you know, here, you know, part of the West End over here. Uh, and then we have some additional monitoring trends that just like we go on the east side. On the west side, back in here, we kind of estuary shoreline, just trying to keep them out of land and looking at the you know, long term, short term trends. So that's the uh, update. Any questions from the commission? Kelly, are they going to con are they going to continue to raise the Lockwood file again, like, as they have in the past? Yes. Okay. As part of the ongoing program. Yes. Yes. Uh, yes. And then ever since you know the, the the state has you know made funds available around 2014. Uh, the, 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 uh, the Army Corps of Engineers and their dredging is, is much more uh, well-funded and much more the typical annual. Or, you know, prior to 2014, that you know, yeah, the Corps would complain that they have no money, so you know, they had to pull buoys and that sort of thing. But you know, the, the dredging is seen. It's, it's, they have it's, it's much healthier now, and they've got more established funding. Thank you. <coughs> Christy, you got anything else?
Thanks for the good okay. job. Thank you. Thank you. And then, you know, thanks. And I, I'm in constant coordination with David and Christy, so if, if you have anything you can you can kind of run through that. All right, thank you. Mr. Hewitt, number eight. Yes, sir. We've got Elsa Watts from Mark Starnes and Associates to present the 21-22 audit results to the commission. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good evening. On behalf of Martin Starnes and Associates, I'd like to present the Town of Holden Beaches 2022 audited financial statements. Some audit highlights. The town received an unmodified opinion. This is a clean audit opinion. I'd like to thank David Hewitt, Daniel, Margaret, Christy, all the rest of the staff for all their hard work on the audit this year. Anytime we request information, it's given to us timely and accurately. Um, we greatly appreciate that working relationship and hope to continue that in the future. Looking at your fund balance, the LGC defines available fund balance as total fund balance, less non-spendable items, less items restricted by state statute. The LGC uses this calculation to compare you to other units. Total fund balance for the general fund was $4.5 million. You had stabilization by state statute of 622000 This gives you an available fund balance calculation of $3.9 million. This is an increase in your available fund balance of about 406000 and this increase is due to overall increases in fund balance. Available fund balance as a percent of expenditures for the general fund was 146.8%. The LGC recommends that you maintain at least 8%. Fund balance for the general fund was $4.5 million. This is an increase of $555,000. Revenues continue to exceed expenditures. Revenues for the general fund were $4.1 million. This is an increase of about 7%. The expenditures were $3.1 million an increase of less than 1%, and I will detail these further along in the presentation. Your top three revenues for the general fund were property taxes at 69%, permits and fees at 13%, other taxes and licenses at 9%. Property taxes were 2.8 million, this is about a 2% increase, overall very comparable to the prior year. Other taxes and licenses were 360000 about a 55% increase here due to the increase in cost of goods and people shopping and spending more as COVID slows down. Permits and fees were 546000 about a 48% increase. The majority of this increase is due to parking fees. Top three expenditures for the general fund were general government at 30%, public safety at 45%, and environmental protection at 9%. General government expenditures were 925,000, an increase of about 6%, overall very comparable. Public safety expenditures were 1.3 million, about a 2% change there. And environmental protection expenditures were 270000 less than a 1% change there. Looking at your water and sewer fund, the current assets were $2.1 million. Current liabilities, 331000 This gives you a quick ratio of 6.43. The LGC would be concerned if this were less than 1%. And then a performance indicator that the LGC measures is that your unrestricted cash for your water and sewer fund over your total expenses less depreciation and plus your debt service principal should be at least 16%. The town of Holden Beach has this at 50%, so everything is in order there. And this does conclude my presentation. Does anyone have any questions? Commissioners? 
You understand every line on this report? Sounded good to me, sir. <laughs> mm -hmm. Assistant town manager or town manager, got any comments, questions? All right. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, you and your staff. <clears throat> Number nine. The audit committee. Um, the audit committee actually already had seen a draft presentation from Elsa a couple weeks ago. Um, we've been through the audit, and as part of the audit committee's responsibilities, we have prepared a message for the public that is in the packet. Um, that is an overview of what we think are. Um, the salient points. But as, as Elsa said, I'm not going to read the whole three pages. Um, as Elsa said, this was a clean audit. And it wasn't just a, one clean audit, because we also had audits under federal and state requirements for grants. And so the fact that everything came back clean, there were no observations of internal control issues, I think speaks a lot for how the town has come forward in the accounting department, and I think that financial department has, should be commended for this. So no material or significant deficiencies were identified with respect to internal controls over financial reporting for both federal and state awards. There were no audit findings required to be reported under either federal or state regulations, nor were any material or significant deficiencies identified <laughs> with respect to internal controls. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions on what I have written, but it's basically what is in the report. And you can refer back to this if you want through the year, if you want to go back and see at the audit time what different fund balances were. Thank you, Ms. Pat, and the committee for your hard work. All right, number 10, Ms. Pat. Um, this was the third year on the three-year contract with Martin Starnes as our accounting firm. Um, traditionally, um, audit firms, external audit firms, do operate on three-year contracts. Uh, the audit committee recommends the BOC authorize the town manager to issue a request for proposal as soon as practicable for contracting with an external audit firm. This is important because the audit firms are getting a lot of work from municipalities and just general companies, and we really would like to get this process going so that we can lock up our next year's firm in the February-March time frame. So um, this is the recommendation for the BOC to authorize the town manager. Madam Clerk, does that require a motion? Or just a consensus. Well, um, I thought there might be some discussion about it. If you already, if all of you in agreement, you can do consensus or you can vote on it. So what you want to do? Well, I make a motion that we recommend to authorize the town manager to issue a request for proposal. And I'll second that, Pat. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Those who say no. All right, Mr. Hewitt, number 11. Yeah. So we've got a couple of representatives from the Department of Transportation. Mm -hmm. I believe it's all Chad Hines in the back and Caitlin Marks. They're going to address or speak to the bike lane and the Ocean Boulevard resurfacing project. Thanks. My name is Caitlin. I'm with the DOT. Chad is back there with me. Um, to give everyone a quick recap, and I'm going to step to the screen. Uh, so we are, um, excuse me just a minute. Madam Clark, can we get a microphone to her? Uh, she can take it on. <laughs> can I just it up? Yeah, All right. Now we're in business. <laughs> All right, so we are resurfacing Ocean Beach Road and adding bike lanes. So the limits of that are state maintenance to state maintenance. 
Um, so you can see on the screen that, if I'm saying it correctly, is about Schooner Drive on the west side of the island and then uh, Dunescape Drive on the east side. So a standard bike lane is uh, five feet. We'll be adding bike lanes to both sides of the road, so we need to widen the road by 10 feet. Um, we are doing what we call asymmetrical widening. So instead of adding five feet to each side, we'll actually be adding seven feet on the ocean side um, and then three feet on the opposite side where the sidewalk already is. Funding. Um, so the town uh, did submit for GSAT's DA funding to get these bike lanes. You can see the figures up on the screen. Um, these are just estimates at this point, um, but GSATs did provide about a million dollars in what we call DA funds. Holden Beach is providing a match of about 725000 and DOT's resurfacing portion is about $2.5 million. And again, these are just estimates. So once we actually open the bids, the real prices will be known. OK, so we did have some issues as we were um, putting the project together, some challenges, I should say, with permitting. So what I have on the screen right now, you can see this blue um, kind of shaded area is what we call an area of environmental concern. So for the permit, um, we have to notify all property owners that fall in this uh, red line, which means this is where our project work is overlapping with this area of environmental concern. Um, so this is the line on the eastern side of the island, and then we just have a small part on the western. So that means we notified about 192 citizens in the, on those red lines um, that we were doing work. Um, we received 20 citizen objections. Um, and we, uh, so the agencies asked us to respond to what those objections were. Um, so what we did is this guy right here signed a letter um, that's on the attachment that said that we will be monitoring the work after the bike lanes go in for any sort of drainage issues, and we will address those at that time. Um, so that led us to successfully get the permit issued last week, November 9th. Um, so that dictates this project schedule right here. So at the end of this month, we will advertise the project. Um, one month from today, we will open the bids. Um, at that point, we will know what the actual prices of the contract are, um, in which case we will decide if we'd like to move forward with the project. Um, we will have a date of availability of January 23rd um, that the contractor can get out there, and we will be finished by Memorial Day, May 26th. Um, and while I'm up here, I just threw in our surfacing update. Um, so the purple line on the map is obviously the bike lanes. Um, the green line is uh, 130. Um, so we do plan to add that into our next resurfacing package, um, which will be let or the bids will open in the spring of 2023, which means that work would be available in the fall of 23. So with that, does anyone have any questions? question in regards to um, Harbor Acres subdivision, the third canal subdivision, the first street there, Swordfish, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, the last discussion we had was there's going to be an update survey to so relook at those lines. Um, uh, Chad, have you heard any updates on that, on Swordfish? Uh, I don't have any at this time, but I can certainly... If you would get back to me on that, please. Yeah, absolutely. Anybody got that question? Yeah. I've had some questions from some of the owners who live near the gate and the gated community mm -hmm. about exactly how far the bike lane is going to go because obviously if you go all the way to the gate, mm -hmm. um, there's there's going to be, you know, like a an immediate left turn that they have to make and turn around. Um, so they were wondering if it's going to go all the way to the gate or is it going to stop at the street before the gate? So is the gate, the gate is on the eastern side over here? The west, no, the, the western? on the west end. Okay, so the, it's stopping at the Schooner Drive. Schooner Drive, thank you. Oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, gotcha, that's fine. That's okay. the second to the last street. Yep, yep. That's, that is our state maintenance to state maintenance. That's why we cover that area. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Comments or questions? 
Hey, we're excited that you guys are coming through for us and look forward to a good winter of production and happiness in the spring. Absolutely. I'm yeah, going to yeah. organize a group ride when the bike lanes are there done. So, right. Thank you. Thank you so much. It, yes, right. If, if we can roll into the next agenda item, I can ask them questions under the agenda item. My next, the next agenda item. I have some questions that, yeah, for, yeah. If if we go on to the next agenda item, you talking about number eleven? Yeah, oh, number number twelve. Number twelve. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay. Um, as you say, you're going to have only three feet added to the north side, and so. Um, in the there there's more than three feet in what I refer to as the semi vegetated area between the current end of the road and the sidewalk. So there's gonna be a narrow strip of space. Mm -hmm. Is it DOT that fills that in? And if so, what's the material that it gets filled in? I've had people ask. Okay, yeah, I will have to check the plans to be sure, but I would imagine that we would leave that vegetative is that, yeah, but we would typically leave it grassy. Okay. Um, and then I just had a question as I was looking at things. Does DOT ever do, um, have, a, have an approved pervious product that can be used for sidewalks? The sidewalks are in the DOT's right of way. And where we already have serious flooding issues that go across the sidewalk, I was just wondering if there is a DOT-approved pervious material that the town might consider right. um, in, in particularly bad areas as we move forward. Right. Uh, I don't know the answer to that question, Chad, do you? <laughs> this is why I bring him along. <laughs> Look at, when you look at material, you asked about uh, pervious material versus impervious uh, uh, for sidewalk. So when you go to the agencies to apply for projects, like we've already been approved for what's out here today, you know, and that's, that's your impervious concrete. For pervious, uh, I'm, I'm thinking DWR has a percentage on what's considered pervious versus impervious on sidewalk, but DOT doesn't have a, a catalog of pervious type. Uh, we, we use pervious type of pavements like on interstates and so forth to help drain the water. But right now, speaking of sidewalks, we don't really have anything. I, I would have to rely on the agencies to tell me if this qualifies as 100% pervious or not. Okay. But they do make pervious concrete that's used in a lot of areas. Yeah. That's fair. And I just thought while you were here, I'd ask because yes. if you had a list, it would be you know just beneficial to have that. Well, the question came up, can the bike lanes be pervious? And we do not have an asphalt for that thickness to be pervious as well. So we treat it at places that we can treat it. And we've, we've been very effective on other islands doing that. Okay, thank you. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Are there any other questions? That's it. All right, thank you for asking them. Thank you for your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, are we back for number 11? Is that where we are? No, we just finished. We just, we just finished, finished that? 12. We just finished 12. Okay. We're, we're at 13? Yeah. I just wanted to make sure that's where you wanted us to be, Miss Pat. Chief? Good evening. I hope everyone's doing okay this evening. So couple of things for the police report this month. Uh, for the most part, we're just business as normal in November. Um, what I do want to mention is, well, actually, we'll, we'll go through this page before I get into my public service announcements. Uh, the first three pages there are just our numbers for the month. Like I said, business is normal. Um, the next one there is our, the incident case reports that we took this month. Nothing there that was, that was alarming. We've got our state citations we only issued four this month. None of those were at the low-speed vehicles. Uh, 
our ordinance violation was seven. One of those was through a low-speed vehicle. And I did not get that. I, I made a note for it myself, but I didn't write it in the packet this month. Um, Jim and I could not connect until after I had already submitted the information, but he did give me the numbers from the last month, and they had 296 violations, which is something I have been reporting, but did not get it in there in time, so I apologize about that. Uh, he and I also talked about the overall numbers for the entire season, and um, I jotted those down. If you'd like for me to provide those, I know it's not something that's been asked for, but I have that if you're curious about it. Yes, sir. Yeah, so, so for the 2022 season, um, he's, he's telling me 2,311 citations out of some 64,000 vehicles that they parked, which is about a 3.5% violation rate and a 96.5% compliance rate. So for the, for the most part, they're ha very happy with those numbers. Um, the numbers sound very accurate to me, so, but that's, that's the numbers he's reporting as far as violations. Um, you know, the financial side of it, I, I do not know, so that's, can't answer those. Did he That's, give you a comparison to other towns? He did not. He and I have not had that discussion. I'm sure That's something I could ask him about, but I, I don't have that information. Um, in, in, in discussions with him, the uh, comparison on citations is significantly below other places. Generally speaking, that was his uh, impression, and he has shared that information informally with discussion. All right. good. Seems to work very well. All right. So if there's no questions on those. I just got a couple of public service announcements, and then one more thing. Um, Can I the, ask yes. a quick question? Um, what about since we've changed, uh, did not change the speed limit to 45? Have you had any issues with compliance with that? As far as people, we had an incident Sunday of a child almost getting run over the car doing we, excessive speed. We have. We have been working on traffic enforcement down there. Okay. Um, it's not been a huge issue that we've seen. We have we have done some enforcement down there. I okay. won't say it's been an issue. Not, okay, not that we've observed. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I, can, I live further west on the island, and I have noticed this, the speeds are significantly better than they were in the past. I didn't realize how much faster 45 miles an hour was and because they'd run 50 or 55. But it seems to be good in your enforcement there at the pump station, and before it seems to have everybody paying attention to their speedometers. Well, thank you. Thank you. It's amazing what some blue lights on the side of the road would mm -hmm. do. Yes, it is amazing. <laughs> um, so what I want to get into is um, the Holden Beach uh, run, Holden Beach. I think we talked about it last month that it was supposed to be scheduled for anyway. Hurricane Ian showed up and and delayed that for us. So I want to make the announcement that it has been rescheduled for December 10th. I don't know if that information has been put out there. and maybe still in Christie's glory if she was going to do it. But um, we want everybody to know to plan accordingly that it is, uh, it is scheduled for December 10th. So if you have to be anywhere, leave early. Uh, they're going to start blocking the road off. It'll be the same thing as it was last time, just the date change. And we're going to have cones and pilot cars and lane closures from High Point Street all the way to the traffic light, which is about two miles. And then, of course, the race is much bigger than that. Like we talked about last time, it goes all the way to Lulu's or just about to Lulu's. Uh, so it's a, it's a half marathon. So if you're, if you're traveling that day, please leave in plenty of time to be somewhere if you have to be there. Um, you know, just, just don't get in a hurry. That's, that's my public service announcement on that. And if you have any questions about it, I'll try to answer them if I can. Chief Dixon, what are the times that they'll be doing the run HP? So... I actually jotted that down somewhere here. So the five, they're, they're doing a 5K that starts at 6.45. The half marathon starts at 8 a.m. And then the one mile starts at 8.30. And the one mile actually goes east. The half marathon starts going towards high point. And the, or excuse me, the 5K goes towards half point, high point. The half marathon turns and goes across the bridge towards Lulu's and back around. What time? I know they're runners. The estimated time of completion. So my guesstimation, guesstimated time is lunchtime. I would tell you it, it should be done much quicker than that. But if I tell everybody lunchtime and we get cones up early, I look good. If I tell everybody nine o'clock and we got cones out at eleven, I'm getting cussed out. So yes, sir. It's going to be lunchtime, y'all. Thank you, Jeremy. Yes, sir. Um, 
couple of equipment updates. So the, the two vehicles that we ordered last year finally got delivered to the upfitter. They have been working on those. We've still got some equipment on back order. Mm -hmm. So we've got two trucks that are about 85 to 90% completed. Uh, we've been talking to the upfitter and he's he's just he's waiting on parts right now to get us get us finished up on those two. So we're we're just about to the end of the rainbow on, on finishing up some stuff from last year. The truck that was ordered this year has shown up. Uh, we're going to deliver it to the upfitter hopefully this week, definitely before Thanksgiving, um, and it'll it'll sit in his queue. But he said he'll he'll go ahead and start putting in what he does have. So we'll we'll have some turnaround and hopefully hopefully have some vehicles back on the road to replace some of these older ones that are. Is that Lieutenant Deal Workers helping you with that work? Yes, sir. It is. Good job, guys. Yeah, yeah. He's he's helped us tremendously on that. So um, that's that. And then. One more update that I wanted to give, and then I'm going to roll it into something else there. But, so in the budget, we were approved for the interview room camera system and the back office suite and everything to run it. And part of that was a program so that in the next few years, the system was buildable so that we could add in-car cameras and body-worn cameras to the system. Um, the back office suite and everything was ordered when the budget was done, and the interview room was also ordered. The interview room is set up. The cameras themselves are on back order, so we're having a little bit of delay on that. It seems that everything is on back order. Um, but that's, we're, we're good on that. Um, but what I want to do is, I have some people in the back back here that showed up. The Hold Greater Holden Beach Merchants Association got together, and they have been doing fundraisers on behalf of the police department um, through uh, raffle tickets at uh, festivals they've been doing and um, you know they've been doing yard sales uh, dunking booths we actually we got in the dunking booth one year for them <laughs> so they they have been going above and beyond and what they have done is they have called custom signals which is who we order our stuff from and ordered us over eleven thousand dollars of body worn cameras and had them delivered directly to the police department and Good. I just, it's amazing. So, as a token of our appreciation, I would like to ask Jeremy and Miss Gina and Miss D to come up here. And I think, did Mitch make it? We have Mitch and Mitch was not able to make it and Pete. I don't have anything fancy to read to you, but this is just a little token of our appreciation. And this is a plaque that says 2022 Public Safety Support presented to the Greater Holden Beach Merchants Association for except exceptional cooperation and equipment donations. And we thank you for your support to the police department. That sums up my report, and that's that's all I've got. But um, and I know there was a lot of other people involved in that, but the, the Merchants Association, you know, they just they, they really did it. So, thank you for everything. But if you have questions, comments, or concerns, I'll be glad to answer them if I can. Mm -hmm. Good thank job, you. Jeremy. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Number fourteen, Mr. Evans. Sure, I'm pretty sure that uh, <clears throat> the inspection department is not going to have a whole lot of people doing fundraisers for us. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that's ever going to happen. <laughs> Although we do do an awful lot for public safety, but I don't think that's going to happen. You can get one of the old ones. You got a new truck. You can get a truck. After 11 years. All right. <clears throat> this is the inspection report for this month. Um, uh, the one thing you'll notice uh, it, it, this month is, is this is usually in this first part of the year we start to fall off the new home 
uh, starts, and that's because everybody's trying to finish before the holidays, and some of them have run over, so they give priority to those homes. Um, but we are seeing, it'll show up on the next month, we are now seeing that wave that we usually get between here and February for people who are trying to get in at Easter and before 4th of July. So we get these waves and they come. And some hang around for a while. Like we've got one out there I think has been hanging around for 16, 17 years. Still being worked on. So um, for new permits, for new home permits, we have 39 that are active at this time. Uh, other active permits, we have 305 in the slot that are being monitored and worked. Uh, permits issued, we have seven this month for over 30,000. That's the, usually the substantial improvements, which adds quite a bit. For permits issued that are, that are waiting to be picked up, we have 13 total at this time. And the total permits that we work for the whole entire month are 357. We've got 29 permits that are in review at this time. We've got two in CAMA that are in review, and we have zoning, uh, zoning permits that were issued are 15, with CAMA permits that were issued were 6. It says permits that we serviced for the month was 94. That's the ones we actively put our hands on once they're issued, and we monitor and keep up with, and we had a total inspections of 374 for this month. Also this month, we had our 10th annual contractors informational meeting that was on November 10th and we had over 70 contractors in the room that signed up at that meeting we had four separate agencies that were represented represented and then our department represented three including two of the town departments and then the FEMA guidelines so um, the electricians that came to that meeting got two hours of free con ed um, we're hoping to be able to get some of the contractors con ed free at some point in time in the future, but it's going to require some logistics and looking at some laws. Um, our new inspector, she received her first level one certification. She completed 48 hours of class time. She had her inspections that are required on certain structures. They were performed and performed correctly. She, had her, she completed her six month probationary period. And now she had, and she took six hours of exams to become certified in her first level certification, and we're very we're very happy about that. She's currently signed up to take the building next, which is a little bit more hours and a little bit more testing, um, but uh, and that will be in January, and hopefully we'll get her tested by hopefully sometime in March. We're hoping. All right. So that's currently where the building inspection department stands. Um, uh, we've had a pretty good month. We've actually cut some of the reinspection fees down. Our turndown rate was working, running around 80%. It's now fell down to about 70, and we're hoping after the contractor's informational meeting it'll fall down some more. Um, reinspection fees are really they're really important because that tells you what kind of what kind of quality of work you're getting and what the relationship is between the inspection department and the contractors. Because what that means is is that we're basically educating and whole and not educating one at a time. So we're, we're happy about that. That, that number's a good number. And so that's, uh, that's the inspection report. If I left anything out, y'all can add it in. And I can report that nobody has had a fundraiser for the inspection. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Number 15, Frontal Dune. All right. The Frontal Dune. This is, uh, I was asked to bring back the the minutes and the five recommendations, um, uh, I'm still at the same place. The planning board recommended option five, and we brought back the information that was requested by uh, Commissioner uh, Kutowski. Okay. Any questions, comments? Okay. I, I, I am not disagreeing with the observation that if we allow walkways to go out further, we're going to end up with a lot more debris on the beach when we have storms. We all know it happens. Um, my question is one of how, when you have deep dunes, and they are not 300 feet, but they can still be significant. I know people can walk over the dunes to get to the beach. How are we going to keep them on a track? Because you know what's happening. They're wandering all over the place. This becomes the problem when you have 
multiple dunes and it's not 300 feet, <coughs> you stop them at the frontal dune, the town's frontal dune, take them down into the dune system, and then there's a lot of meandering. So what's a possible solution for this? I do not know. I mean, I, I don't, don't know. I know that the 300 feet that seems to be significant has no bearing on that. The 300 feet that was put into the, to the exception on the west end was because that was the number that required you to get over the water, and the exception was brought to the commissioners because people were, could not get over the water. So the west end exception for 300 feet had, had, doesn't have anything to do with that. It had everything to do with them having the capability of getting across the, squat, the swash down. But it is used by people who also are 300 feet and don't have a swashed cross. I, 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 don't I mean, it's just there are period, there are places that have the swash and there are places that don't. But but but, but, but it's still it, it's I still have the question of how we get people to the beach without wandering all over the dunes and cutting through multiple dunes. Well, that would only be a problem where you have a public walkway. I'm not sure that you can. That, I mean, if you are you going are you suggesting that we should make an ordinance that says that we would dictate what, how you walk from the end of your walkway? Across your property to the to the edge of the public I'm, I'm trust just, area. I'm just asking if there's any potential fixes to help people walk to the beach consistently instead of everybody wandering all over. That's all. I I just don't know what other what other beaches do if they don't have walkways that lead them out to the dune. I think what happened was was that the tasker, we looked at the other beaches and found, I, this is what I got back from them with their taskers, and I don't know, but the, that other people didn't allow it either, and that <clears throat> their walkways weren't allowed to go all the way out, and most of the other ones either. And I, I think it's Sunset that has a 300-foot buffer no matter what, and they, to my knowledge, they have nothing that dictates whether you wander in and out. What seems to be, though, is it, it, in, it, as far as, and I'm not talking about that, but as far as protecting the beach, what seems to be is, is that it seems to, everyone seems to have adopted, including Tama, that it's better not to have these structures go all the way out. It, that's what we do know. I don't know how you're going to stop someone from going left or right when they walk off the end of their walkway. I, that I do not have an answer to. I wouldn't care if they walk left or right if it was just consistent. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, the, I think maybe the problem that lies in the, maybe the rental folks not going left and right. Most of the property owners, as even myself, when I go to the beach, we use one lane to make sure we don't tear the dunes down. Those dunes are going to protect our homes. So uh, I see the point that most homeowners, I think, would uh, be cautious as how they want to and consistent. Well, I think. I think that the original concerns were not that they were walking all over the place, but that they were walking in one place and cutting a pathway through the dune. That was the original concerns that we heard. Um, not that they, but, but that the, the walking through in a consistent place was cutting the dunes, and which would be better, having them walk through the dunes or having the walkways go all the way out. And that was what the, the, the discussion was. I don't recall any discussion about people going in all directions. Um, it, it, I mean, it could have been discussed, but I don't remember it coming up. Um, but but the, the real problem that caused the discussion was the, or or that was brought forward was, you know, what are other towns doing? You know, it appeared, and there were some people that were pros and some people that were negative about the people walking through the dune in the same place and creating an escarpment of some type you know, cutting through the escarpment and making a way for water to come through. It does. I think that was the primary concern, what we, we were here. All right, anything else? Thank you, sir. Well, I mean, the, the, uh, I don't know if this is, our, if y'all are going to consider, because that, that, the recommendation was for five to have the, 
text amendments mm -hmm. that were basics in housekeeping. That was the recommendation from the tasker that was sent down to the planning board back up. And so you need to vote yay, nay, or um, nothing. I, I, I know that you said you published it, you know, for comment um, at planning and zoning meeting, but, you know, planning and zoning meeting doesn't get the same attention as this meeting. I would propose that that we put option five on next month's you on, have to. On, you yes, have to. We have to anyway, and that way we will get public comment and can make a decision next month about option five. So I would move that we put option five into the agenda at next month's meeting to allow public comment and a decision by the board at that time. So, so you're voting. You're, what you're voting is to put option five forward. It has to go for a public hearing prior to you being able to vote yes or to make a determination to vote no yes madam clerk do we need in that motion time date certain it's not a regulatory rule but, but she's suggesting that we have it that was the I same that, that, yeah i just want to make sure i think you're talking about two different things you just want it for comment in the meeting not a public hearing it can be at the meeting it doesn't have to be a public okay. hearing we okay. just put it in the agenda so that the public can comment on it as an agenda item that this is the proposal. Right. It, we, but, but like I said, we did put it out for a public hearing or public, yeah, for the public to make comments on it prior to it being voted on. And, um, <laughs> and the only reason we did that was we did that because we were expecting more feedback, but we didn't get it. Okay. So maybe you'll get more feedback on the next one. Yeah. So, is it the consensus just to put it on the agenda? Or do you say more? Yeah. Option five. Madam Clark, do you understand that? Yes, sir. All right. What else? Anything else, Kevin? Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Tim. Thanks, Tim. Number 16, <laughs> Mr. Ely. Mr. Ely's family's had property here a long, long time, and second row property owner down. In the, eight, in the 700 block, so right at 800 behind. Mr. Ely, the floor is yours, sir. Thank you, Mayor Holden. Uh, Joel Ely, 798 Ocean Boulevard West, otherwise known as Double Happiness. Um, thanks for having me here tonight. Uh, I'd also like to, to acknowledge and say thank you for y'all's dedication, uh, your hard work, and your service to Holden Beach. I've been coming here since I was about 10 years old. So, yeah, that drawbridge era. So I, you know, I'm well, well familiar with um, the, the beach is a great shape. I, I love it, and, and I come from Texas. I don't live here, but when I come and I can come across that bridge, it's just a totally different feeling. So uh, thank you for, for what y'all are, are doing. I'm here to talk about 796 Ocean Boulevard West, which is a town-owned property next door to me. Uh, so if you look to the to the left, you can't see it quite real well. I don't know if it's one point or this is another point. Uh, double happiness is to the left. The sewer lift station is to the right. Um, 796 was formerly Sandy Side in two views. So first off, who are the Ely's and why do we care? As, as Alan mentioned, we've been here a long time. My, my mom and dad, Bob and Peggy Ely, built Double Happiness right at 40 years ago. Uh, during the time since they built that, uh, our family congregates here uh, practically every year. Uh, they have three sons and their wives that have been here, uh, six grandchildren and their spouses, uh, ten great-grandchildren that have all been here. Uh, so now four total generations coming to double happiness in Oregon Beach. And, and so just put a... To, Put some faces to it. Bottom left-hand corner is my family, my my <coughs> sons, their wives, the, the, the grandchildren. The right is my eight grandchildren, seven to two. Just just to kind of give you a sense of how important Holden Beach is, the little the little one fourth from the left is Carter Holden Heath. We all live in Texas, but we, we got rid of right here. So that's why we care. That's why I care. That's why I'm here. It's for my kids and my grandkids. Uh, so, so now, why am I here and what is my ask? 
about 18 months ago, I sent a letter in to the uh, Board of Commission. It's attached to the presentation, so it's probably part of your packet. Um, this letter was included in your June 15th commissioner's meeting packet. Um, the, letter, the letter basically stated we need to bring 796 up to some level of acceptable uh, appearance. Uh, fast forward now 18 months, and I'm here tonight. Not much has been done. Now, one little caveat to that is uh, Heather gave me a due date to have my presentation in. I got it in, and um, uh, the next day I had pictures from my neighbors where there was a crew at 796 cleaning up the yard, mowing, cleaning all the storm debris. I, I'm sure it was just coincidence, but that has been done. So thank you very much for that. Um, that said, my family and our guests, when we went to Pete Seasons, this, this is the, the place they get to look at. We're going to look at some here in a minute. So this time I'm here personally, came in from Texas now. I'm coming to close the house in the winter and all that kind of good stuff too. But I wanted the opportunity to come and speak directly to the commission because the, the property just needs some maintenance. It needs painting, uh, cleaning up the paint, there's damaged wood, there's rot, uh, there's things like that need to be done. The ACs are, are rusted through with the pictures here in a minute. Uh, the stands are crooked, and I don't know how long they can stand before they fall over. Uh, I'm not sure why the, the, the town runs those H HVACs, but you know they turn on, they sound like 52 bombers going off. They're, they're a mess. But in any case, uh, we'd like to see those either removed or replaced done something with it. Uh, we removed the, the TV antennas uh, from the back of the house and the wire, oh, sorry, excuse me. Uh, remove the TV antennas and the wire hanging from the back of the house uh, and then remove or replace the phone screen. So I'm just real briefly go through some of the, the pictures that we have. This is from Double Happy. This is when we come into our carport and we start up the stairs. This is what we get to look at. These are the two AC units. That, these probably haven't been serviced in like, forever. You can see the rust on them. The one particularly to the left, the stand that kind of leans like this a little bit. So I think it's, it's just dangerous. Uh, but that's, I can't imagine it being very efficient. And you can see what the paint job looks like. Uh, so those are the two areas of the arrow. This is from the back deck of Double Happiness. Uh, the top arrow, blue arrow, you can see that wire dangling down from the antenna. Uh, that was installed by the tenant that was in uh, in the city that was in there for a while for, for TV service. It still stays there. Then the, the arrows, the other arrows show to the, the rusted areas. The, the grill has been moved back up on the porch that was part of the tenant by Saturday. The next one is, as soon as you come out of the carport, you go start up our stairs. This is, the, this is what we look at. Uh, exposed wires, rust, and things like that. It, you know, it's just, it's not good. Next one is uh, a better view of the uh, side of the house that we look at. The top left-hand corner is the TV antenna that hangs. You see the wire coming straight across the window. And this is just us looking at the back door. And then the other two arrows are the torn screens, and the screens just kind of flat. Again, all this is here at the end. This now has been cleaned up. This was uh, uh, recent pictures that were, were taken to put this presentation together, and that's now been picked up. But uh, a point I wanted to make is landscape is not one and done in the other home something that you have to do on a continual basis. So this is in September when my brother and his wife were here for a couple of weeks. Uh, and as you can tell, that's a, a breeding ground for all kinds of undesirable things. And that was before the hurricane. This is after the hurricane. Of course, it knocked things down. We got about two feet of water underneath our homes over there. Uh, but still a bit of a mess. Uh, these are the steps going up to the porch. It speaks for itself. And then again, this has all been cleaned up. But this this is what existed before we cleaned up Saturday week ago. So back to you know what what is my ask of the of the commission and of the town? And that is please, 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 just just do proper maintenance on that home. Uh, get it painted, clean it up, uh, re, re, uh, replace and repair the damaged wood, 
to do something with those AC units. They're just a total eyesore, and I think they, um, the, re remember that landscape in a home is not a one and done. So thank you again for, for getting that done, but it's something that you'll need to do on a continual basis. Uh, the storm damage has been done. It's just a personal thing for me that that antenna with the wire hanging down. That's just that's just not indicative of COVID. Uh, and then remove and replace the machines. So Holding Beach is a gorgeous place. It is. And probably 95% of the homes people have taken pride in and they're keeping them up. I love driving down Ocean Boulevard. I just look at what everybody's doing, new paint schemes and things like that. And then we have seven nights. My ask is to do this. Um, I think once we get this new, new the, the streets redone, the bike lanes, it's going to be even prettier. This, this 796 is going to be Side note, once I got down here, I got down here on Saturday to start closing up for the season and talking to neighbors um, just as an alternative for, the, for this uh, board to think about. I think we have some interest in neighbors either individually or as a group purchasing that property. So I don't know what the mechanisms are to do that, but I would put it on the however we might move forward with that. We would love to enter into discussions, a uh, small group of us, to buy that property. Then people who own it and care for it will make that a property that we can all be Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Anybody? Any commissioners have a question or comment? Mr. Ely? Um, well, since I'm the last member of the board for the group that bought the building, just a reminder to everybody, the reason we bought that building was as a buffer for noise from the lift station because even though there was some noise remediation done within the lift station as it was raised, it was still a question whether the decibel level at the house at 796 would be within the acceptable level. So that house provides a purpose. It buffers noise from the lift station. There's also been an evaluation done, a rough evaluation of what that building could become eventually as a parks and rec type of facility to keep it within the town, maintain it as that noise buffer and have a service to the community which hasn't been decided but it has been looked at. I will say that I assume that any town property is going to be periodically inspected, looked at, somebody sticks their head and makes sure everything is still okay inside and that anything going on outside that is unsafe is taken care of or money is put in the budget if anything major is done. So I would have to ask how often people are checking in that building um, just to make sure things are operating. And if every year it gets a look to see if there's some routine maintenance that has to be done, just like we would do for other facilities. Because if stuff has to be done, we'll have a budget discussion um, in the very near future. I, I think that's a. I think that's a great question. Interesting question. Um, from what, at least from what we have observed, I've observed, and as my family has been there I, since the tenant has left, not much activity has gone on. Just things have continued to deteriorate. Uh, we've also looked at and think we have a very clever way to mitigate the noise. And I would just tell you, those air conditioning units next to my house are a lot noisier in that lift station is to, to, to 796. It is, it's horrendous. So I'm not, if, if, as a buyer, I'm not, in, I, I'm not worried about the noise coming from that lift station because it's not that bad. It might not meet the requirements, but it's not that bad. And I, I, I think we can figure out a way to, to allow us to accept that as a, as a condition of safety. But, but in, in any case, regardless of what's, you know, what the future plans may be, it, even if it's not to sell, but it's just turned into the community, you know, that's wrong that get bed. But until then, basic maintenance to that facility will be done. So, you know, for, for, for my sake, for my health, my family. <laughs> because it's, yeah, I tell you what, every time I walk up my stairs and I look at that, I go, move. 
Thank you, sir. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. So we have we have in the budget for I believe this fiscal year the money for the engineering analysis for that property, and it was presented for the recreation to do a to, they presented a master plan and I, I think last summer, and that was viewed. So is it possible to move forward with at least making the move to get the engineering analysis and? revisit the master plan to decide what we're going to do with that building because if we're keeping that building then certainly the pain in the air conditioning needs to be addressed right now i mean anybody that lives next to that that building it's it's not acceptable i don't believe current currently tim and i are working together with uh town manager hewitt and we are going to get the um engineering analysis done um, the amount of money that was put in the budget was forty thousand dollars and so doing anything extra as far as painting and air conditioning is currently not included um, if the board was reconsidering going back to your ideas for that then you know that would be different than before we get the engineering analysis done I would think that we would not want to spend the money if the board's going to look at something different okay Ready to move on? Well, I've got one question. Uh, I, I, that that in, in just in looking at that facility after we discussed it for its possible uses, I walked around the house and noticed that the back door was wide open. And I called Jeremy and he uh, he had the, uh, someone come and check it and lock it back up. But as I was going up the back stairs, uh, they uh, seemed to be in really poor condition. Is that something that we need to? Is that something we need to put a, a sign up or a block, block the, that, the steps or something to keep someone from getting hurt on that property? Jeremy, I'd check it again because when we went two days ago, that door was open again. Um, as far as the, as I walked up and down those steps, the fasteners are, have degraded just like they do on a lot of other um, but right now it's not occupied. It's not being occupied um, if, if there's someone going in and out of the properties. I mean, I would recommend posting that as no trespassing because I think that's the only way you can stop them any other way. So, um, but if they're going to go up the steps and they don't live there, I'm not sure me posting it will stop them from going up the steps. You could remediate them and take them down. I mean, you could remove the steps if that's... Uh, appropriate you could remove the air conditioners but I would not recommend removing the air conditioners unless you're going to replace them because they are we've been inside we've been inside the structure and it is it looks really good on the inside it's it not does. great but it looks good on the inside and there's no mold there's no mildew you know what I mean it, it protects the structure by running the air conditioning system and the heating system but I it, I'm not saying you shouldn't replace them I'm just saying don't, don't cut them off uh, I will tell you this and, and give him a peace of mind that the, 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 those units will not be allowed to go back on the side. Um, our current ordinance is going to require those things to either be moved to the front or the rear once we start doing some work there. So they will not be allowed to remain on the side of the structure. Um, we are in the process of trying to get our hands on an engineer. Um, we're more interested in the, uh, uh, me and Christy has talked about it, um, we are more interested in getting a layout or a site plan for the board and then have the engineering analysis done. If we don't know what we're going to do, our engineer doesn't know what he's looking at. So we need to determine if the structure can handle the, the rearranging of what is being asked there by the park direct board um, for those ideas that they have. So I, I, I a floor plan, to, in my opinion, is as important as the engineering analysis, and the two need to go together. And that's what the $40,000 was for, so that we could get to that point, uh, is my understanding. So um, so the town can decide whether they want to remediate those back steps by taking them down. I can, I can flag it. I can tag it and flag it, and, and we can put tape up. But if somebody's going up and, up and down the steps... You know, and they don't live there. I'm not sure that'll stop them. Well, if somebody gets hurt on those steps, too, reliable, right? I was just going to say, I 
would suggest marking them. The only other thing I'd add is that uh, during the summer, um, one of the beach rangers did notice on a weekend that a vehicle that was parked there, and so the police were called down to check that out. I think somebody had um, illegally parked um, and was using the space, so that was taken care of, and they were towed. But the police have been on keep check for that property. Um, when we did find the door open, we did do, do another um, keep check for it, and the staff has been in there periodically since we bought it. Thank you. We're ready to move on. We're going to talk some more. You could take the screens out. Say what? They could take the screens out. Yeah. And the, the can we get the antenna and the wire taken down? Uh, you know, I think if we're going to keep the property for recreational use, which I think we need, because I think with the bike lanes, we're going to need bathrooms down there for people bicycling. There's nowhere for them to go to the bathroom. But I think mainly if we make an effort to show the neighbors that we are working to get this property taken care of, I think that's going to help out a lot if we're going to use that property and need it. We just need to maintain it, I think. We can't ask homeowners to do things for their property that we don't do for our own, I don't think. Is that something, Christy and him, that we need to put on the agenda for a, a future month to maybe set aside some fines, to, some funds to, to at least make the property look a little more presentable? Well, I, I, I mean, I, if you're asking me, the $40,000 gets you to the next budget year so that you can make appropriations for... Um, or if you decide to go forward and make it into what the Parks and Rec is, has provided for us to start to use. Um, let, me, let me ask a, a question. Uh, two, two air conditioners, they're probably $5,000 a piece. It's $10,000, $14,000. How much does it cost to paint a beach cottage now? $25,000. So are you looking at, you want to spend thirty-five dollars to $40,000 before you decide to do anything on it. I mean, it, it's to, to me, it's, it's kind of straightforward. If you want to do that, give us the money, we'll go change the air conditioners out and slap some paint on it, and then you can come back and figure out what you want to do with it. All I'm saying is do I mean, the simple thing. Because that's why we haven't done anything. We've actually gone in on a, on a fairly routine basis and made sure that the air conditioner's running. Yeah, they're loud, but there's not any moss growing out of the ceiling. You know, it's climate controlled, and the inside is fairly okay. I, I think the thing to do right now is to do the easy things to keep the landscape fairly decent. Take out ripped screen. Just take the screens out. Nobody's living there. Nobody's going to open windows at this point. And you know, take that wire down and you know, as you say, get it, get it done. Get, put up no trespassing and get it get it evaluated so the next budget cycle we have something to work with. Yeah, th all those are no cost easy do yeah. we can make that happen. Yeah. Thank you, David. All right, Mr. Hewitt, number 17. Yes, sir. We wanted to give a after action report for Hurricane Ian, something that we try to, to do at the staff level uh, after every event, but we wanted to share it with the board and the public. <clears throat> Uh, the purpose of the of the after action report is to do a quick rinse in order to review and evaluate uh, what the expectations, uh, the reality, the outcomes, and then also review some of our operational procedures. Expectations. Some of the preliminary actions that take place before a storm comes and sometimes these are a week ahead of time. I know that the the mayor as emergency, emergency management director and I along with uh, Chief Dixon, um, it, it's not uncommon in the summertime to uh, in the course of conversation, uh, wow, something's brewing off the of Cape Verde Islands, we need, to, we need to get ready and it just seems like it happens earlier and earlier every year. But uh, with this storm, of course, we go to a more formal, when it gets closer, we go to a more <coughs> formal process. Um, and as part of that, the mayor as the emergency management director assembles the staff 
in order to uh, get our arms around, well, uh, you know, just, just what do we think is going to happen. Uh, some of the preliminary actions, once that we think that it's going to impact us, we do some of the easy things like pulling the beach mats up, dropping the shade sails, making sure uh, all the generators, all the vehicles are fueled up, uh, pre-positioning gen uh, generators, um, hoses and pumps, uh, in addition to coordinating with the fire department, who's a very important partner in our emergency preparedness uh, here at Holden Beach. And um, oftentimes I, I like to uh, joke that when we drop the shutters on town hall, it seems to get people's attention. <laughs> so we, we, we use that, um, one, I don't want guys up on a ladder once the wind starts blowing. So we, we, we kind of use that as a, it, it's, it, we're, we're for real when we drop the shutters on it. So the hurricane itself was forecast as a low grade category one after we convened with our partners in, in Brunswick County uh, with a probability of canal flooding. Uh, as always, every one of these storms are different. Uh, the uncertainties that goes with weather forecasting, um, uh, once, once Chief Lane left uh, as the chief weather forecaster, uh, Ms. Ferguson has, uh, looks like she's, she's spot on with some of her forecasts now and how she does it, I don't know. <laughs> but that track that we were presented with, in some cases, or from some perspective, did give us a, a, a false sense of security. Uh, what we what we thought um, was going to, and what we saw, were two different things. Based on what we saw, no evacuations. It's a minimal hurricane. Thought perhaps you know, make sure you get your furniture off the back porch, secure your doors, those types of things. As a matter of fact, Mayor Holden and I were sitting at the at the pier watching surfers uh, in the morning, uh, Friday morning at about 10.30 going, oh, those are they're getting some pretty good waves, the wind's offshore, it's not really rough, you know, and in, in, in about two hours, we, we should be in the clear. Um, and then the tide was, the tide was coming in, so we uh, used the better part of Valerie's discretion and backed up off the beach, but still, um, you know, came back to town hall thinking that everything was going to be fine. And, and it, it wasn't a bad storm, but there were impacts. So what, uh, what we were able to do with this storm, we have uh, a new tide chart, uh, a new tide gauge uh, that is installed down on the Holden Beach Pier as part of a project and program with the University of Hawaii called Tohonu, and it gives us real-time real data on just what the tides do and uh, as compares it to what it's expected to do. Um, in addition to our local uh, siting of a wind gauge and rain gauge here right outside of town hall. So the, the, the hurricane track itself, it looked like it was going to go into, into Charleston. It wasn't going to be that big a deal, but at sometime, you know, mid-late morning, it took a jog to the right and looked like it was going to go up through Charleston, and ultimately it ended up going uh, through Georgetown and Conway, which is 45 miles at the crow flies from here. Um, so those factors together, because of the way that the storm came through, that's a long reach of a storm, to, it, the storm's gyre, to uh, to propel water out in front of it across the uh, the Atlantic Ocean, um, and so what we got on top of a, of a like the coastal engineer said on top of a six foot high tide, we got an additional five feet of tide, and that tide happened within about two hours. So that was that that was unexpected. Uh, one one thing, a couple of things that that were good is that fortunately we didn't have any issues with power, and we didn't lose any water because everybody was staying here. Uh, the the sewer 
lift stations themselves. We had to shut them down, and Chris is going to chime in here in a minute and talk about the, the lift station's performance and uh, the ability of the crews to, to get them back up and running. But, uh, from, and, and I know that there are those that uh, know more about this than I do, um, but what my impression was is that this was a tidal surge, not storm water. This was a dry storm. There wasn't that much rain and, and there wasn't that much wind. Uh, what we saw was a tidal surge and not storm water, which is uh, historically referred to. Uh, rain is what you think of as storm water. Um, saw the impacts in the canals, the 300 block, and then the west end. Those, uh, the canals, the 300 block, and the west end are the places that we have seen them, seen those impacts with the puddles, the quarter, long, quarter mile long uh, flooding on Ocean Boulevard. It's not the first time that has happened. Uh, this is just an example. This is not an, intended to be an eye chart, but uh, one thing that I'll, I'll point out here is that in in this this is this is a daily tide cycle. The blue and the black lines are what's forecast. Note here, this was about noon on Friday morning, and within two hours, this is this is six feet right here. Within two hours, we um, there was an additional five feet of tide that came in. Now it fell off, of you know, within about eight hours, but it didn't go all the way down to a normal light low tide. Um, but shortly thereafter, things did return back to normal. Here's a picture out at the Greensboro Street lift station, lift station number two. Some of our guys, um, I don't know exactly the timing of this shot, but it shows you um, us, the crews, trying to react to that storm surge coming in. Uh, this is Charlotte Street, and I know that we've had questions in the past on, um, and I think there's an agenda item tonight on it, uh, can, can the sewer system run or what type of improvements do, do we need to make to it? And that sewer system, the lift stations, they were never designed to run under three feet of water. And if you look down the street there, there's a, there's a, uh, a stakeside van, a utility van, and the water is up to the bed on that van. That's about three and a half feet. That's Charlotte Street. You can see the mailboxes up to the bottom of the mailbox. It's just not, it's just not, it's, it wasn't designed to do that type of performance. This station four, I believe this is, shows you some of the water that was down in the bottom of it. Same thing, just a, a series of pictures uh, with, for lift station four. Um, and while this did not harm the lift station, um, it's not exactly the safest type of environment for crews to be walking around in, especially when there's, you know, when it's 600 amp circuits in there, 600 volts of power uh, going through that thing, 480. It's a lot. The outcomes, uh, Mr. Mr. Clemens lost a truck. He got flooded out um, down, near, uh, down toward the west end. Uh, do want to? I know that I said it last week. Do want to express our sincere appreciation to the fire department, Chief Todd, Todd Robbins, Tyler Johnson, and Ken Hall of Engine 872. They were instrumental in helping us pump some of the floodwaters out, specifically on the west end down there. Uh, a couple of other observations is that lift station four had water over the top of the slab in the wet well. The station number four basement uh, needs a watertight hatch, and Chris has got some uh, some ideas on improving the the robustness of those already uh, in lifted lift stations, if you will. Uh, along with a wet well needs to have about a 24-inch collar added to the top of it. And of course, we're right now we've met with Leo Green on the timing 
of when to advertise for the upfit for the Greensboro Lift Station 2 effort. Uh, continued outcomes, the perfect, this was a perfect setup. I know Chris was cracking at the last meeting. It never seems like a storm happens except for when uh, the check-in day is the next time. So we had that blow come through, uh, the water fell out, you know, there was some marsh grass pushed up alongside the road and up under people's houses. But pretty much uh, after, after working um, 17 hours, the public works had, uh, by noon the next day, those lift stations were operational. Um, and as a suggestion, we recognize and have some ideas uh, that the island needs some type of, of island-wide emergency drainage. But... With the fire, and, and it's proven with the fire department, if you don't have some place to pump the water, all the pumps in the world don't do you any good because until the tide falls out, you can't pump the water anywhere. Uh, if it wasn't enough that we had a, a, a storm breathing down on us uh, <coughs> simultaneously, I believe it was Thursday evening, Friday morning, uh, we had a ransomware um, uh, issue that we had to deal with. Our hosted network uh, provider was, uh, was attacked, and uh, fortunately we were able to um, uh, encapsulate our systems where they weren't, uh, where they were not impacted and were able, we had a, um, we didn't do anything for a while as far as putting word out because we didn't want to open anything, you know, get a, get a virus, don't open it up. So we, we uh, chose the, the more cautious approach because the last thing we wanted to have happen was to compromise our comms and our systems when um, went in the middle of a storm, but everything is fine, no harm, no foul. Uh, what we did realize is that normally we ramp up to a storm, we go through this process on acquiring food. We got caught short, and the public works crews, you know, they were out there working. I don't need the public works guys that are trying to um, take care of the lift stations uh, being hungry and looking, looking around for food, so we're going to do a better job on making sure that we take care of the, the folks that are, that are working um, out there in the field whenever these, these things happen. Uh, as an aside note, I know that a couple of weeks before the storm hit, we actually had performed our annual sea oats harvest. Uh, had we not pulled those sea oat seeds when we did, um, we would be less less likely that, to have a robust as program as we do currently. Uh, Mr. Evans got it right out here, he and Rhonda the next day, doing a windshield per assessment uh, <coughs> along with the canals and docks, and I believe that the estimates that we put forward there were about eight million dollars worth of damages. Um, that the way that works is that in order to make a disaster declaration, those reports are uh, forwarded to the governor's office eventually, and a declaration is made. But uh, it's important to note that strand damages are not included in that estimate anymore. As the engineer said, uh, the strand worked great. Uh, our communications during a storm, we do not try to be a near real-time relayer of weather information. We assess threats and advise people accordingly as to what um, they should be doing in terms of taking care of life, limb, and property. Um, and then we focus on, once the storm gets here, then we focus on doing our assessment and then reconstitution of the island. Uh, I do want to, uh, uh, we had some questions about debris. 
our disaster debris contract, we do have a pre-positioned disaster debris contract. It is scaled in the event, for in the, in the worst case event, that we have a storm that sits houses in the middle of the road. That's the scale of our um, disaster debris contract. We don't try to scope it down to the level of pulling out, uh, being able to pick up people's flooded couches um, that have been inundated on the canals. And the reason for that is, and it's a conscious decision, we can revisit it, but um, if we scale our our disaster debris contract for that type of of service, then it's going to ultimately, and we've seen it in the past, encourage people to build below flood elevation. They're not supposed to do it. So that's one of the reasons why, the main reason why we don't scale that service that way. We were fortunate we were able to get the uh, declaration status up and down within uh, a time frame that allowed people to come back on the island on Saturday, shortly after the storm had passed. We got lift stations back up. And one of the major takeaways here is that we're going to be, uh, at the staff level, we're going to be evaluating uh, what we call our walk-away uh, point of service delivery. Um, based on some training needs for our uh, sewer, water and sewer guys, uh, specifically around electricity. Um, the margin between standing out in a truck up to your knees in water um, with an inundation event that we had next to a lift station. That's a real dangerous environment. And the last thing we want to do is to have a tragedy occur when um, when folks don't realize everything that's involved in getting that big system up and running. That's all I have for the uh, the update on it. All right, any questions? All right. Thank you, Mr. Hewitt. Ms. Ferguson? <clears throat> Yes, sir. Every year um, at this time of year, you guys have to reevaluate the Warden Smith contract. Um, they do provide a service in advocacy at the federal level. Um, three outlined areas are federal beach nourishment issues, Lockwood Folly Inlet, and also um, dredge sites and dredge spool as far as the uh, issues we ran into with our canals and federal legislation that came down about where those dredge pools could be placed. Um, approval of the contract, which you have at attachment two, would require a budget amendment to increase B Park professional service expenses by 44.9, funded by a fund balance appropriated increase of 44.9. The remainder of the contract will be e executed through the existing funds in canal dredging budget specific to the item on dredge material to spoil sites. And they did not go up on their contract from last year. Looking for a motion. I'd like to make a motion to approve uh, the Ward and Smith contract for 2023 and an associated budget amendment, including directing the manager to e execute the contract. Second. Motion of the second. Any more discussion? Hearing none. I'd actually like to ask whether or not all of these items um, need to be included in the upcoming year and whether or not we can't have a slightly um, less service for a year in some of these areas. Um, federal issues related to beach renourishment options. We've just done FEMA. We're continuing with the core. Um, we are supposed to have an earmark for a million dollars that will see our core study finished. So it would be for the two years that would be a million dollars and there's the outstanding question of the additional 1.25 million but I'm asking how much we have to have in terms of information on federal issues on beach renourishment right now other than making sure that we get that earmark and the core money 
and in addition, up to three additional federal advocacy priorities. Again, I would actually say this year our priority is probably going to be infrastructure funding, which will be related to stormwater when we eventually get the plan. But given that we're supposed to get the sewer station grant, which will be, again, an earmark, um, what additional things are we thinking is going to pop up given what our own priority objectives are for the next year? I do not want to walk away from Ferguson Group and Warden Smith, believe me. I'm simply asking if in the upcoming year do we reasonably think we can have less work for them to do that we can maybe talk about a slight reduction in the budget needed. I'll answer a couple of those for you, and then I'll defer any remainder of that to David. So as far as the federal level related to beach nourishment, um, in my opinion in working with them, they do count that as the core project. So that's all their engagement, not just that earmark, but everything they do with keeping that project pushed along in advocacy at the federal level. So when it outlines beach nourishment, if they come up with any other grant opportunities that they see there, they may put that forward. Last year, I think, because this is exactly how their contract was laid out last year, the other three things that um, I would say that they probably put that towards, even though it was an outline and it's not exactly laid out in the bill that way, was when they did assist with earmarks and making visits with those funding that, that came out for stormwater and that kind of thing. So. Um, I can say that he can go back to them, I'm assuming, and ask them about a decrease in service level, but I think that you're definitely locked in for the big three because those are things that we need that are listed. If you wanted to ask about taking, you know, what they think the considered bottom three that are not named that the town might need and what that reduction might be, but we are butting up on their contract, and so you guys may need to appropriate enough money to get through a month if you're not gonna, you know, if you wanna wait and revisit it again in December. And then past that, I would turn it over to David to chime in with anything else he wants to say. I would just like to add, for those of you don't, who don't know what they did for the town last year, they did an amazing job. It was absolutely incredible. I can't see a reason not to continue with, with the advocacy that they provide for the town. They have found money where we didn't, wouldn't even know where to look and has helped tremendously. So. To say that we're getting our money's worth is an understatement, at least for the last fiscal year. So that's that's my opinion and a little piece of information. They did a great job, and I think it would us not to continue with the fund. Right, I have to agree with you on that. Is and we don't know what's going to come up this year and what's going to be available for the projects. We got the one now. Uh, this is no time to back off. Dr. Judd, you got anything to say? Yeah, I concur with what's been said. You look at the past, and that's about all you can go on, and they certainly know what they're doing, if anybody does, and nobody really does, but they know how to get things done, and they brought the bacon home in the past for you, so I'd stay with them. Help me out here, Madam Clerk. Do we have a Motion? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We had a second? Second. Mm -hmm. All right. All in favor say aye. Aye. Uh, Opposed? Say no. no. Four to one. All right. Thank you very much. I think I get to keep going. Do I get to keep going? Yes, ma'am. We want you to keep going. Okay. So the uh, town applied for a CAMA grant for funding for um, land acquisition for the pier. 
Um, that funding did come in because you guys approved the contract. It was $166,484. That will be placed in a line titled CAMA Grant Peer, Grants Peer, and will result in a decrease to the accommodations tax line in the same amount. Um, when you decrease the revenue side on that, because we would be decreasing the uh, amount that we uh, remit to the county in the amount of 27448 um, therefore you would need to have a corresponding decrease in fund balance appropriated that will be used to equalize the revenues and expenses. So the suggested motion is approval of the attached budget amendment. What's your pleasure? What's your pleasure? In essence, this is this basically this housekeeping. This, yes. This recognizes the reimbursement for the purchase of the camera reimbursement for the purchase of well, I'd like to make a motion we approve the budget amendment ordinance amending ordinance 22 14 and the revenues, revenues and appropriations ordinance for the fiscal year 22 23, amendment number five. Second. Second. Okay. All right, any more discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? <coughs> Unanimous, Madam Clerk. Thank you, Ms. Ferguson. Thank you. Mr. McCraney, we got any money? I'm not going to be changing any money, just trying to. This amendment's going to add interest accounts for the town's various debt services. And adding these accounts was actually suggested by the auditor to streamline end of year entries and financial statement preparation. And in addition, this amendment will also aid in the implementation of the town's new debt tracking software. So. Anybody want to put forth a motion? And this is Hatchkin. Motion to approve Ordinance 2227, amending Ordinance 2214, Revenues and Appropriation Ordinance for Fiscal Year 2223, Amendment Number 6. I'll second that. In discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Unanimous, Madam Clerk. May I ask one question, though, Daniel? Yes. Uh, just a little bit of description of what the new debt service, the new debt tracking software does. So it's going to help us with those end of year entries and also it's going to give us reminders when we have payments due and just that's really about it. We acquired that software to be in compliance with GASB 87 for our leases and this is just a, kind of a bonus of it. So. Okay, thanks. It's going to uh, vastly automate what is now a, man, a, a lot of manual process. All right, we ready to get to number 21? <clears throat> Ms. Pat. Okay, um, this, this is just kind of like general sewer stuff. I've had people asking questions. There were some things sort of lingering still. Um, so, I'll just go through them. Uh, several months ago, the town manager indicated there were some issues at Station 1 that might require some work. Um, in fact, I think you mentioned one meeting that Chris wasn't here because he had been troubleshooting at Station 1 until got awful hours of the morning and we probably didn't want him at the meeting. So I was just wondering what the status is at Station 1. Is there anything going to be required in the near future um, to perform any repairs or upgrades? Um, let, let me start off. Well, go ahead. Go ahead. I'm going to go ahead. Good. Good mic. Yeah. I don't see anything in the near future. Some of the problems there that Dave was telling you about right now is we had some issues back in the summer, and it was basically the system was waterlogged, and we were actually thinking we were it, – it, sort of emulates a, a vacuum leak and we were actually spent a lot of foot time trying to find a vacuum leak there that weren't there and it actually being waterlogged and it took us a while to get everything cleared out. Um, I have spent about $20,000 uh, that's going to 
some equipment's going to be put in there. Probably the first of December is some equipment to help us monitor waterlogged situations where we're not guessing. You know, it's kind of new technology. It sounds good, and I was fool enough to bite the bullet, and I'm hoping that it works out in our favor. I mean, you don't know till you try. But as far as anything major, I don't know anything major during years to come, but, you know, I don't can't, I really wouldn't know what to speak, what's going to happen when we develop different properties or whatever some of the undeveloped areas on the beach. But I will say that that, is, that station is a workhorse. Okay. <coughs> um, the second one was uh, obviously, again, because of Ian and the system being turned off, um, people go back and they look again at the Medill report and what was recommended for the sewer, sewer lift stations. And um, I went back to, and as we all know, the McGill report, there were three options laid out, option one, two, and three. One was do nothing, two was do what we do, what we've done, and three was a slightly different system um, that was based on what Oak Island was doing that that the report says um, makes the station flood resistant. It's sort of a description. So I had a question from somebody about whether or not option three, would that have prevented a shutdown during Ian? If yes, should station two be changed to option three? And if yes, should planning be put in place to look at remedia further remediating stations three and four. So the first question is, would option three in the McGill report have prevented the Ian shutdown? No, it would not. I uh, basically, you know, we've got just what we, we tried to do, our major components of that system, you know, we're actually up above base flood elevation, so that wouldn't have kept you from being able to shut that system down. You know, I wish everybody, I don't know if some of those people asking those questions were here or not, but I wish I could see those pictures that we're looking at on the screen there a while ago where it looks like basically you've got houses they are built in the intercoastal waterway. You know, if somebody thinks that you're going to have sewer service them kind of times, that ain't never going to happen like I said the last meeting. So that's my take on that. And as far as the three and four where you're talking about going back and doing something to those, there's some minor issues there that I think I can take care of in regular housekeeping, and that would be that hatch that David had on his bulletin up there, which is not no big money. And actually elevate that wet well about 24 inches, and as far as I'm concerned, that, that should do us. You really wouldn't be getting no, nothing, nothing. You wouldn't be gaining nothing by uh, by doing that other than spending a lot more money than we, than we're spending now. That's hard I mean, to get. It, it's just I think it's it's the question about the you know what's written in the report that people are saying what did they mean by flood proof because they discuss the Oak Island one and saying you know that's basically similar to the Holden Beach because the tank and the sewage pumps are in the lower part of the structure below grade, but the pump stations are flood proof without any structure openings up to the base flood elevation. So that's what raised the question. Yeah. Well, I said you wouldn't be gaining anything. You can't run that system when it's like that, and that's just all there is to it. I mean, and actually, you know, if you tried to run it like that, I mean, you put people's lives in danger right? trying to keep this stuff running. Thank you. Okay. Going to clear a five minute recess. We've been here three hours. Two. We're back in order here. Uh, somebody help me. Where are we? Number 22. 22. 22. Miss Pat. Okay. Two of, two of these were actually addressed at the special meeting. This was a, just a reminder and a request to staff for expanded financial reporting on things that the board had asked for at the budget. Um, we already started with Block Q and the peer project at the last meeting, at the special meeting. So the peer project already has some split out expenses, and we said we would do Block Q as soon as we start to get some traction on that project as well. Just a reminder that the staff also asked for expanded financial reporting of professional services. And um, professional service costs have now received a percent of their total budget where the details are warranted. So as we move forward, um, we'd like to see some additional 
detail on what the professional services are being applied to. If it's town attorney, if it's an outside attorney, um, if it's the cost of the audit, whatever other things come up in the different professional services. That didn't we already ask for that? But we, it, it hasn't been started yet in the financial reports. Okay. That's why I'm just reminding that we did ask for it during the budget. Right. So it should, now that we've got a good percent of the professional services budget starting to get used, it's the appropriate time to start giving us more detail in the financial reporting. That's all. Okay. I mean, I'm assuming nobody's changed their mind on that. We did ask for the budget. No. 23, Ms. Pat. <sighs> okay. Um, I'm actually hoping this is going to be fairly straightforward. When we were working on the parking plan, the ordinance as it was originally put forward was that there would be no right-of-way parking <clears throat> except in designated areas ever. And I raised the question whether people were really sure that, that that's what they wanted because there had been some indication that people had answered an HBPOA <coughs> survey question on do you or don't you support right-of-way parking and some of them assumed it meant they could still park in the right-of-way adjacent to their home um, and that obviously is not the case. You either can or cannot, um, and so saying you could only park in designated spaces um, was going to disadvantage people on side streets and back streets. So when we put the ordinance in place, we said for this year, let's allow right-of-way parking outside of season, outside of the paid parking season, and after 5 o'clock, during the paid parking season. So that's how we've been operating, and that is what the ordinance currently says. We said we, could re we would revisit this. If we have to do something, you know, we will have to come up with ways to address owner concerns about being allowed to park in their own right-of-way. But well, I thought that's the way when we drafted that ordinance, we drafted it so they could park in yes, their own right-of-way. Yes, but... but but the question is, the question was, it was, it was, this is what we're going to do right now because we don't have time to sort anything else out. Mm -hmm. Now, if people are satisfied with how it is now, that there weren't problems during the summer with after 5 mm -hmm. o'clock, all of a sudden there was a lot of parking in right-of-ways where, where parking wasn't allowed during the 9 to 5, if people are happy that things were under control, we don't have to change anything, okay? But if people have legitimate concerns because they had problems with what we allowed, I need to know it before I try to go down a path of fixing something that might not be broke. Well, I was in looking at this today, Pat, I called uh, Officer Dealworth, Lieutenant Dealworth, because uh, he was busy working on the upfitting the vehicles. And he said that just it, from his standpoint was was not an issue. He didn't they didn't see that many calls for people were not parked in the mm -hmm. in the right of ways like their own driveways and, and, and adjacent to their own properties. So what we have being a co chairman of the parking committee, what we're gonna do is probably get together sometime either before the end of the year or the first of the year and kinda do a lessons learned. With uh, the police chief and officer deal work and uh, Jim with the parking committee. I mean parking auto connect. And uh, yes. if there's any input from any of our citizens, they need to channel it through the normal normal channels. Get it to uh, Heather and make sure that we're made aware of any issues they have, so we can all commissioners will be aware of it and we can we which, can act on it. Which was going to be my request if. And, and it's not people living on Ocean Boulevard <coughs> or in the gated communities because Ocean Boulevard, you can't park in the right way anyway. And gated communities, obviously, you know, you don't have people coming in and parking. 
So my, my question is, were there, were, were you adversely impacted by the ordinance the way it's written that after 5 o'clock during the summer, the right-of-way is opened up for parking? Did people have problems after 5 o'clock when pay parking ended? Did they have problem on their streets with suddenly there was a lot of right of what cars coming and parking in the right of way? Jeremy, but, did you hear of such? Can you speak to that? I, I, we did, to my knowledge, we didn't have a lot of points in that. Okay. So if there is, there is any, they need to communicate well, I, that's to That's what I'm at. It to please let us know, like in the next month. Mm -hmm. Yes, please. That if you, if you have bona fide problems, outside of the parking hours with people parking in the coming in and parking in the right-of-way and I'm talking about a lot of trouble I will say this I, I did have a couple people contact me on this particular mm -hmm. issue wondering if we were going to take their mm -hmm. rights away to park in their own right-of-way and I said I didn't think that was the intention this was just a question so there are people worried about lo losing it, so I, I think that everybody's probably happy with it. But wait, is if they're not, speak up. Speak up. Right. Because to to go further to try to fix something that's not broken, right. to fix to fix it to people's you know desire is going to take time, and it's going to take significant amount of effort and it will have a cost associated with it and I just want to I also had some people contact me no we are not proposing adding more right-of-way parking as designated parking this is this is really about we said we would do something for year one because we didn't have time to address it any other way but if it's working we don't need to change it just need to make sure that people are okay that it worked for them. Just uh, one, one comment that I'd offer up uh, to the point of process regarding any considerations that the board has on uh, fine-tuning the parking ordinance. Uh, the, the parking committee is over. So it doesn't exist anymore. So it's, it'll, be ma it'll be managed, that process is managed by the board. Correct. Yes, sir. Me being a, a board member, I, got you. I was asked to sit with them, and then I could communicate it to the board. Because we did promise the public that we would, and we would give any them input, give any input. Will be appreciated. That's right. Okay. So again, if people on the side streets and back streets had problems with right of way parking over the summer. After 5 o'clock at night, they need to let us know that there were issues because the police chief doesn't think that, that he got a lot of calls. I have not heard people complaining, but that doesn't mean there aren't some people who had problems and just didn't say anything. Okay. Number 24, Ms. Beth. Okay. A um, couple months ago when um, we were looking at the Coastal Storm Damage Reduction Project um, and the information available, we did, we did ask for the staff to request uh, minutes from the first year meetings, any minutes the Army Corps would have on meetings and also further cost details by month. These are both things that the Memorandum of Understanding says that the town, a municipality, its partner is entitled to. Um, and I was wondering, have we received anything more than what we no. already got? Then can we ask him again? Sure. Thanks. That's it. <clears throat> Public comments? Anybody here want to talk about anything good, bad, or ugly? Does not have to be on the agenda. 
You can even come forward. You can even say something nice. <laughs> All right. Hearing and seeing no one. Town manager's report, Mr. Hewitt. Yes, sir. I'll be brief. I uh, wanted to apprise the board of the fact that we're still awaiting the uh, federal final inspection on our beach project. We have been requested to supply some additional supplemental background information for the federal reviewers. One of the problems with that is they seem to change a, a reviewer about every three months. So it's a, it's a constant we're having to educate the, the federal FEMA folks. Um, the bottom line on that, until that final inspection is performed, they're withholding approximately $600,000 in reimbursement. Um, what remains uh, for action items on our behalf and, and that timeline to do so is unknown at this time. The important takeaway, though, is that we are, once the final inspection takes place, we're subject to a up to a top to bottom review of that project, everything that went into it to include our purchasing practices uh, for up to three years after the closeout. Um, but the good thing is, is we had that sand in front of the of the on the strand before the hurricane season hit, and it's holding up well. Uh, for some bad news, most likely bad news have been informed by the tax administrator of Brunswick County that Holden Beach's tax values are up approximately 65%. Uh, that will be the uh, values that going into the upcoming budget year for the 23-24 budget. Uh, at this time, the revenue neutral tax rate is calculated and estimated to be in the 11 cent range compared to, yeah, for the town, town of Holden Beach, uh, compared to the town's currently uh, 20 cent uh, per hundred dollars. Brunswick County is working diligently to up, update those tax values all the way up to the 31st of December, and we'll have more information uh, coming forward as the issue progresses. Uh, as an aside, item of interest, now with the first complete season on parking complete, the revenue that the town gathered from that first season, which is October through April, and again, it crosses budget years, but for a season, that amount is $455,000. Um, to building inspections uh, specifically, I'm going to call Tim Evans out. Not that um, we don't have great staff across the board here, but he gets the uh, manager's congratulations this month uh, for another successful workshop and uh, additional activities. And specifically, um, I want to uh, address a fact that uh, for those of you that may uh, not being to know that over the course of the last 18 months or so, Mr. Evans has been the subject of not one, but two investigations into his competencies by the North Carolina Code, Code Officials Qualification Board arising from specific complaints registered with the North Carolina Department of Insurance. Both of those complaints have been dismissed as being without merit. Tim, I want to thank you personally, professionally, for continuing to enforce the rules that you're charged with equitably, fairly, and above all with reason and a rational nexus of basis, regardless of the administrative, organizational, and, oh yeah, political pressures to do otherwise. My hat's off to you, sir. Uh, on a lighter note, uh, was able and fortunate to participate along with Mayor Holden today uh, to install an installation ceremony for the with the Greater Federation of Women's Club Little Library down at Selfish Park. Uh, a couple of other other 
items or events that are going on. The turkey trot is going to be held Thanksgiving morning here at 8 o'clock. You have to pre-register with Christy, and you better go ahead and do so because there's over 100 people uh, registered <coughs> already, and it is a food drive, so bring a can of, a can of whatever you got. Um, uh, lastly, the reminder for the Christmas tree lighting on the 1st of December, Thursday evening, 6. Entertainment's going to start about 5.15 and 6 o'clock for the lighting itself. And I have one final comment. The, the repeated questions on what the insurance costs are for the pier along with the, um, well, anyway, both of those questions, oh, the insurance costs on the pier and also the uh, news about the environmental holdup on the camera permit for the bike lanes, um, that information was reported on the insurance bill. That information was reported back in July or August, if I remember. Now, unfortunately, matter of fact, I believe it's been reported two times. Unfortunately, my report comes at the end of the agenda. Um, and our setup here is not to engage when the, but that information has been provided along with the briefing and report to the public last month on the issue with the camera permit. The night you heard from the Department of Transportation that they received the camera permit 9, uh, 9 November. So that information is a matter of record and has been presented to the public and the Board of Commissioners in previous meetings publicly. Any questions from the commissioner? The mayor's comments? I had uh, some good friends that reminded me that I had always said that after October the 15th we wouldn't have storms. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to tell you, we did not have a hurricane. <laughs> So those of you that prayed it away, thank you. Uh, Just don't poke the bear. Huh? Don't poke the bear. <laughs> um, anyway, I think things are going pretty good in the town. My complaints uh, have been reduced drastically uh, over the last couple weeks especially. So thanks to everybody for what you're doing. Mayor Pro Tem, Mr. Rick. What do you have, sir? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I do have a few things. I'll try to be as brief as possible, but I want to again thank our uh, Merchants Association for being so kind as to uh, <coughs> set up the raffles and the dunking booths and so forth to allow our police officers to uh, be upfitted with with body cameras. That that's that's a big plus for our town, and uh, the Merchants Association does a lot for the town of Holden Beach, and it is. I want to make sure they are they know they're appreciated uh, we had a veterans lunch here on Wednesday of last week uh, that I attended there was probably about 50 people here or better but I want to thank our staff uh, all the girls in the office uh, mayor town manager everybody was here uh, the, our police chief was also there we got some veterans on the force uh, it was really a, a heartfelt meeting I, I personally am not a veteran but I Attended and I really I really appreciate what y'all do for our veterans here in the area. That was a that was a great great meal a Great a great time was had by all of them good pictures made and stuff. It was uh, to me. It was a, a lot of fun uh, I wanted again as David did I want to thank Tim Evans for I think this was the 10th year putting on the uh, contractors forum as I called it I mean, this is an opportunity for the people that build our houses and make sure that our island is safe, that they know what's new, uh, what's coming around the corner, and most of all, what, they, what he expects of them. Uh, he thanked a couple of organizations for doing a real good job, but uh, Tim stayed up here all day. And, and again, 
our town staff, the girls, served us a wonderful meal. It was uh, it was a good time had by all. Nobody had any cross words. Tim came out unscathed, and uh, I, I think it's a, a real compliment to our town to have somebody be able to stand up in front of the, the contractors and tell them that uh, you know he wants he wants them to do the best, uh, so he doesn't have to, to fuss at them. I guess uh, the festival by the sea was fun. Uh, the pancake breakfast at the chapel, I believe. Uh, Mr. Mayor, they said they raised about $1,500 from what I heard this morning. So that was a big success. There was a lot of, a lot of hard work went into both of those, the festival and the, the pancake breakfast, and it's really, uh, it's, it's really good to see that we support that. Uh, the emergency management for this past storm, S4N, uh, there's a lot of work that goes on behind the scenes that nobody sees. But uh, we are aware of what's going. We, we communicate with uh, with all the entities, uh, whether it be the weather or the Brunswick County Emergency Services, and we are uh, we, we are as ready as we can be in, in the case that we have to do something uh, as the storm approaches. We don't wait till it gets here. It's done in the, in the, in, in the well beforehand. Also, uh, I want to talk, we, we did, we are making progress on the pier and Block Q with the engineering people. Uh, we met with some of them and uh, kind of have them you know, hopefully guided in the right direction so they can get something back to us soon. So uh, we're not sitting on our hands. We're, uh, we're out there actively trying to, uh, to make this happen. But we all need to be uh, mindful that this is the season of Thanksgiving. We should all be thankful for the blessings that we have of being able to live on this beautiful <coughs> island. I want everybody to enjoy the Thanksgiving holiday and please be safe. Mr. Brian, I also want to thank the staff again for the for the veterans luncheon I also attended. That was a very nice gesture. Met some really really nice people. Heard some interesting stories. I'm sure they could talk for days and days about what they've been through, and uh, we don't know how lucky we are to to be sitting here because of each and every one of them and the service they provided to this country. The contractors meeting was again successful. I'm a contractor on the island, it's very informative and it accomplishes exactly what Rick said to educate us and to hopefully getting a nice green sticker on all of our job sites saying we did a good job and we are keeping everybody safe. We are not by any means sitting on our hands with the pier, block queue, um, storm water, all the various things, we have RFQs and RFPs out for bulkhead and the 800 block. There's a lot of things in the works, but it's not going to happen soon or quick. It's going to take a lot of time and a lot of planning. I know I stopped by 796 today. I, I totally feel your pain, but it's, it's in the cards too. It's not something that's going to be pushed by the wayside. We will do something with it. Um, and all of these projects are going to, they have to go through the proper channels. We want to do them right, so we have proper planning and, and um, hopefully at the, at the end, <coughs> with some patience and some guidance from, from the engineers and, and whatnot, that will turn out an excellent product that the town will be proud of and that will be safe and enjoyable by everybody. I do wish everybody a happy Thanksgiving. Um, Family is very important, and you know it's it's a good time of year to just take a few days and just be thankful for for everything that you do have. And I'm happy with the way things are going right now with the town. We've met, like I said, we've met the engineers. I'm happy with the way we're progressing, and I think at least the attitude up here, sitting behind this desk, is a lot better than it used to be. So I think we're making some progress. Doctor? I just want to add, uh, they've mentioned thanking everybody. Um, I do want to add, I think Festival by the Sea, it was good to see more vendors and the crowd was, seems like it's back to its pre-COVID state. So it was good to see everybody out having a good time. That's positive. And can't thank the Merchants Association enough, keep our officers safe. I think that was a very generous thing for them to do and I'm greatly appreciative of that. Um, I want to wish everybody a safe Thanksgiving. 
and hopefully we'll have some nice weather and it'll be enjoyed by all. Thank you. Ms. Pat? Um, just feeding a little bit on what Brian said about we have a lot of RFQs and RFPs out. I don't ever remember in the five years I've been a commissioner having this much stuff out there at once for bids and for projects that we know have to happen, and I'll just say in the near future, not overnight, but within the next few years. And let's remember, we can't have everything going on at once. So part of the planning is going to be picking the order things go in. Um, we have limited staff. They work hard. They do a great job. But, I mean, we can't do 10 projects all at once, even though we'd like to. So even if we had the money, we wouldn't be able to. So again, be patient. We are working on it. There's been a lot accomplished, accomplished these past three to four months. They'll be even more accomplished through the next few months in the budget period. We're on the right track, and we'll figure out how to do it the best way possible for the money we have coming in year after year. Wish everybody a happy Thanksgiving, and look forward to seeing you in December. Okay. Well, to appreciate all that has been said and concurring with it, uh, and in the spirit of Thanksgiving, of course, we all are thankful for all the good that we receive. But I'd like to reflect, to overstate the obvious, on the spirit of service that you've mentioned here in the town of Holden Beach. You see people, employees here, not just here for a paycheck, but for a mission. They get the job done. I see the cars early at work. I see them leaving late. And I witness sometimes, as you do, some obstacles and challenging moments when uh, I'm very thankful that our public servants are able to retain civility and courtesy and kindness. And sometimes I wonder how they do it, but I'm thankful for it. And for the mayor and members of this board, I say the same to you. You are surpassing. <coughs> and as a citizen, I appreciate what you do. You give meaning to that old biblical missive about to whom much is given, much is required. And you make Holden Beach government truly of the people, by the people, most importantly, for the people. Thank you for what you do. Thank you, Judge. No. Mr. Hewitt, I do have a question for you before we move on. Would you tell us what our Christmas decorations are? Did Santa Claus come and hang those, or is that nobody said anything about it? But and we got some new ones, or? Yeah, I have to. I'm a light. I, uh, I, I just I'm going to blame Christy for that. Okay, I'll take my best stab at this. Um, every year in February time frame, we order snowflakes because that's when the company puts them on sale and we are always looking to use municipal dollars the best way we can. So we store those over at the EOC. Right now we are very short staffed in the public works department and those guys are putting out things as they can. So we may be a few days earlier than we were in the past, but in order for us to be ready by Christmas, we might need to start now. <laughs> But I have heard several people say that some of them look new and different, so they could have been part of this last group that came in in February, and it's our first time seeing them up. Okay. They look nice, Christy. Oh, they do. Thank you. I also ha heard that we had some that were not functioning and that we had some piecing together that happened, so we may have created some designs of our own. <laughs> and that's all thanks to the Public Works Department as well. <laughs> well, they look good. Yeah. Uh, right, ju just, you. just so you'll know, though, that the purple street lights are not part of the Christmas decor. That, it, that in fact, is uh, a symptom of the LED lights starting to fail. They, they go purple before they go completely out. So that's not part of the Christmas stuff. I didn't know if that was a vape or something. It's Halloween. <laughs> All right, let's move along here. I believe we're on number, uh, where are we? 29. 29. Miss Pat, is that you again? Yes. <clears throat> I got going, okay? <laughs> I was writing it. <laughs> this, is, this isn't going to be long, but we do need to consult with our attorney. 
Okay, you want to make you want to make a motion of some kind? Um, I move we go into closed session, and Heather will read the usual. All right. I need a second, maybe. All right. All right, Madam Clerk. Closed session pursuant to North Carolina General Statute. All right, ladies and gentlemen, Thank please all excuse for us. Thanks, thanks for enduring the hours. We're, we're now back to seven. Back. I need a motion to adjourn. I made a motion to adjourn, sir. Second. All right. All in favor, say aye. Aye. aye.